Hi, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize for the volume. Um, I couldn't adjust the volume on my microphone, and it's not a great microphone, so if you have audio problems, I'd recommend you turn down the volume on your computer. <laughs> so, uh, My name is Jaden Ford. For my study, I was inside of a 7th grade language arts classroom. Um, the way that it works at this school is if you are an ESL student that is level 3 uh, or higher, then you would be in a normal language arts classroom um, with an ESL endorsed language arts teacher. Uh, so the classroom that I was in had a very high proportion of uh, ESL students um, that were higher than level 3, but it's also because she is a ESL slash Spanish teacher. So uh, those in normal language arts classroom, there was a very high proportion of ELL students. Uh, from the 22 kids in that class, 10 of them were ELLs, uh, two were level 1s, uh, one of them was a level 3, two of them were level 4s, and the remaining five students were level 5s. Additionally, there were a few aides in that classroom, student aides, that were ESL, ELD students, so sub-level 3 students um, that I take an example or two from, so it's helpful to know. Um, up on your screen, you should see a picture of the classroom. The classroom is designed to single file rows. Uh, there was a lot of individual work, but the teacher would also allow for group work, specifically among ESL students. Uh, they could work with a native speaker and uh, have certain aspects of the assignment translated for them via the students. Um, the day-to-day -day operations of the classroom usually involved a journal or a starter uh, before going into a lecture on the topic that the students were studying at the time. Um, then they would get a worksheet or some kind of packet uh, regarding the topic, such as argumentative writing. The ESL students would do the same packet as the normal students. Um, and then that's where I would come in. I would possibly translate parts of it for them, or I would do other ESL, uh, ELD-related activities for students, such as helping them do reading counts and English tests, uh, which is what my first example comes from. Uh, in my first example, I was working with a level 1 ESL student. Um, he was reading a book to me called Read to Tiger, and uh, in particular, he was. I asked him to translate uh, the part that he had just read to me um, into Spanish, though it was in English. Uh, and he began to do so, but then froze the word tiger. And when I asked him if he knew what it meant, he did not, so I translated it for him. Um, the Spanish word for tiger is tigre. Um, so I told him the Spanish word for tiger, in which case he began to pronounce the word tiger as tiger. And this is interesting because um, it takes some of what he knows about the language and he melts it together. So here I've written the English word tiger. And as you see here, you have the phoneme t before the diphthong i, and then the ending sound g and er. In Spanish, you have the short or the small i, which we would pronounce as the long e sound e, so t, e, g, er, e, and e as in pet. And uh, he pronounced it tiger, where we see the the short or the long e sound from tigre, the e, the vowel sound, with the g and the er from the English word tiger, but there is no vowel at the end, so the student did pick up on that. However, he stole the vowel pattern from his native or home language, um, which was very interesting. Uh, syntactically, one of the students, one of the level 5 students, um, wrote an argumentative paper on whether we should eat bugs, or whether uh, it was okay to eat bugs, and just to take a few things from that. The first sentence reads, First, many bugs, careri, many deadly disease, become most bug are in the trast. And so a student does an interesting thing here, because they're... They appear to try to transcribe phonetically what they're hearing, and you can see that here with the word desid, which here has the short s sound as in pet, so we say desid, e eh, desid, uh, and the word disease uses a similar sound to the s sound, but it, we would say it, so it'd be de rather than the de, um, and then the student uses a the student uses an alveolar sound in both the z, which is the what we would expect to hear, and the dziz, and 
the student transcribes that as a d alveolar, a stop versus the fricative z. So he hears disease versus disease, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, the student also seems to have some understanding of subject, verb, object, sentence structure, but um, they do they they seem to have a questionable understanding of uh, number when it comes to case agreements. So in this particular sense, it reads: bugs are not like best food source. Because people just don't know where bug have come from. And here, you see the word bug have. Have being a plural form, um, which should, so we should have bugs have. Um, similarly, we have bug are not like best food. Bug, singular, are not plural verb like best food, which is the object in question. So as you see, the student does have subject verb object agreement, but the number of agreements is wrong. Finally, uh, my last example is taken from one of the student aides who was an Arab student, and he was pronouncing, he went to ask the teacher if he could get a drink, um, and he pronounced it, can I get a trink? And he doesn't roll the R like that, like he said it more like trink. But um, what's interesting about this is that the student uh, pronounces the T and the R sound right, the tr sound right. Um, however, he does not seem to have a control of the alveolar stops because the D is a um, it's a it's a voice stop, while the T is a voiceless alveolar stop. So when it comes to what I would change when it comes to curriculum or materials. Uh, the first one, I might spend more time uh, in the Tiger example. I might spend more time working on call and repeat with the student so that they can really get the pronunciation of the of the I sound in Tiger. Um, but the student does seem to have an understanding in his own language of what E, so Tigre, he does understand the vowel, uh, how the vowel comes after that. When it comes to the syntactic errors, um, the student should work on number and case agreements. Um, additionally, I think that it was brave that they try and do the phonetical transcription, but um, I, there, there could be some work done there. I, I wouldn't want to push that, though. I'd rather work on the uh, number and case agreement idea. Finally, when it comes to the third example, the student, um, I would need to observe more, but I believe that with enough time, they could learn to master the phonics of the of the. Uh, alve voice versus voiceless alveolar stops, the t and the d in trink and drink. Um, so that might be something that I'd spend a little bit of time working on, but that might be one-on-one, -on -one, uh, not necessarily something that I would uh, do curriculum-wise. Thanks.